Well, I get excited about teaching the Word, finding out everything that God has available to us. And I'm always glad when I have an opportunity to give my testimony because there are so many times that people don't know how to get out from under the bondages of the enemy. And God wants us free in every area of our life. Now, I was reared in a Christian home, had wonderful Christian parents, very happy home life. And I was in my little Baptist church practically every time that the doors were open. Later, I fell in love and got married. And again, uh, we were in church all the time, and it was a happy marriage. But about six months after Angela was born, a little Buddhist girl moved into the apartment right behind us. And I began to feel compelled to go and witness to her. I felt like it was my duty as a Christian. Now, I had not shared Jesus many times. I was in my real early 20s. But I had this guilt compulsion that I certainly didn't want her to go to hell. I had a lot of mixed emotions because every time I'd go out in the backyard and even get close to her apartment, I mean, I would get terrified. And I thought, I don't know what's causing this. I didn't know anything about the enemy. She kept her house very dark. She burned a lot of incense. She had a lot of things that had to do with the New Age. Of course, I didn't know what even know about the New Age at that time. And uh, I thought how sad that so many Christians don't talk about the mnemonic realm. They don't talk about anything that we have in Jesus and how we can overcome that realm. And so a lot of people are just totally ignorant of that. But <clears throat> I finally decided, okay, I've got, to, I've got to give her a chance to know Jesus. Well, when she answered the door, I told her, can I come in and just share Jesus with you? Now, I was not expecting what she said. She said, I'll be happy to let you come and talk to me if you'll give me equal time. Well, that sounded reasonable, but I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Now, I had no knowledge about putting armor on. I didn't even know about that. I didn't have any knowledge uh, about uh, spiritual protection. I I'd been reared in a Baptist church, and they taught me a lot of foundational taste things about salvation. But they had never taught me once about spiritual warfare. Now, I don't remember a thing I said, but I remembered that I finished in just a few minutes. And then she began to tell me about her religion. And I don't remember anything she said except that she wanted me to keep an open mind. Well, I've often said I kept such an open mind that my brain fell out and I didn't find it for several years later. But I remember that while she was talking, my mind just started reeling. And I became so confused that I couldn't think straight. I remember thinking that I can't even keep my thoughts going in the same direction. I, I felt like I, I was literally, I felt like I was going crazy. And all of a sudden, I became so engulfed in fear. And I kept thinking, I've just got to get out of here. I've got to get out of her house. Felt like I was choking. Her house was really dark. You couldn't even see in there. Well, doubts began to bombard my mind. And I spent the rest of the afternoon walking in circles around the park, trying to get my mind to straighten up. Because I felt like, I said, Lord, you know, what is going wrong with me? I feel like I'm crazy. And all of a sudden, these what-if thoughts started coming. What if there's no God? What if the God I serve is not the right God? What, what if Jesus doesn't even exist? I'd never had thoughts like that before. And I thought, where on earth are these thoughts coming from? And I finally just totally panicked. And I didn't tell anyone because I was so ashamed of those thoughts that were in my mind. And I knew nothing about spiritual warfare. I, I had no idea what was going on. Well, it finally got so bad that I made an appointment with my pastor. We had joined the Methodist Church by this time. Uh, I had joined the church with Jack when we married. And my Methodist pastor had no idea what was going on. He couldn't help me at all. So I thought, well, I'll go back to my Baptist pastor. We're a friend. And he really couldn't help me either. So I don't know what made me think I needed to go back to the Methodist pastor again. But when I went in the second time, his secretary told me, <clears throat> uh, I'll go back and tell him that you're here. Well, I was sitting there waiting, and finally she came back, and she said, I'm so sorry, he's already gone home. Well, I went and sat in my car, and basically I was just sitting there thinking, God, what do I do? I, 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 need, I need to hear from you. I need to know what to do. And all of a sudden, I saw this pastor come out the back door. He looked in both directions, and then he ran for his car. And it just crushed me at the time. It hurt my feelings. But I thought, you know what? Bless his heart. He didn't, he didn't have any idea how to answer me the first time. And he didn't want me to put him through this a, a second time. So I went home, and I thought, if the pastor doesn't even have any answers where for me to go, then I, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. 
And that confusion and that fear just kept growing to the point that I would wake up in the mornings and I couldn't think, I, I couldn't function. I, I felt like uh, there were times I would lie there in bed and think, I can't even move. I'm, I'm so, it, it was like I was terrified. And I, I couldn't figure out where the fear was coming from. But the fear got so big that I entered into a mental agony that I can't even describe now. I cried all the time. And all I wanted to do was go to sleep. But when I would go to sleep, I would sleep so fitfully that I would be miserable. So I came to the point that I had quit praying uh, because I was in so much fear. I had quit reading my Bible because every time I picked the Bible up, everything I read frightened me. And I just thought... Lord, what if all this is just a joke? What's going on? Well, I started slipping off to the library, and uh, I would wait until Jack went to work, and I'd read everything that I could get my hands on about every foreign religion that I could think of. Now, I wasn't trying to find a foreign religion to go to. I was trying to disprove them in the hope of proving that mine was right. But I was driven, and I was tormented. And it must have shown even at the library because the librarian found out who I was and she called Jack and she said, something's wrong with your wife. You need, to, you need to check and see what's going on. Well, after that, I was forbidden to go to the library. I couldn't go to the library anymore. But that compulsion and that drive was so bad that I would slip encyclopedias out of my parents' house in the diaper bag and take them home with me <clears throat> so I could continue to study these different religions. And I had a list of them. And I would find something that I knew, okay, I can't believe this. And I'd mark that one off the list. My intention, you, you have crazy thoughts like that uh, when, when the enemy's dealing with you. I thought, well, when I mark off all the false religions, then I'll know mine's right. You know, that's crazy, but that's what the enemy was doing. And finally, <clears throat> it came to the place that I was not able to stay by myself. So Jack would drop me off at my mother's house every morning when he went to work. And she tried everything. She'd turn the lights all on in the house to make it real bright and cheery. She'd take me for long walks and long uh, rides in the car, but nothing in the natural was working. And finally, after weeks of that, and nothing got any better, Jack decided that he needed, he had to take me to a psychiatrist. Well, they found one, thank goodness, uh, God got him to a Christian psychiatrist, a Dr. Zale out of Fort Worth. And he was the one that screened all the Baptist missionaries before they went out on the field. And I remember the relief that I felt when I thought, okay, finally, now maybe I can get some help. Well, after having long talk sessions with me, he finally decided that he needed to put me on a series of electrical shock treatments. And this lasted over a period of several months. Now, I, in my right mind, I wouldn't have gone for that. But I was ready to try anything. It didn't matter. I just wanted some help. I wanted to get well. And so it seemed for a while that it helped because it would make me forget. And it would blank out your short-term memory where you couldn't remember what you were afraid of. And that wasn't working really well because I knew I, I couldn't remember what was bothering me. But it bothered me that it was something bad enough that I had to have shock treatments. And so I kept thinking, Lord, what, what was so bad that I had to have shock treatments, you know? And, um, but for a while, I couldn't remember what I was agonizing over. Then after the shock treatments, he put me on some really strong antidepressants. And he, he warned me, he said, now don't ever try to quit these cold turkey. If you ever decide to come off of them, you're going to have to come off of them very slowly. Now, I stayed in that state of just wanting to sleep all the time, partially because I was drugged with those high-powered pills and partially because when I was awake, I was miserable. And by this time now, my memory had returned. Well, after a couple of years on these antidepressants, it seemed that I could function a little bit better, but the least little thing would blow me away. So it was like living on a roller coaster for my family. You know, you, I, I can't even imagine what they were going through. <clears throat> but finally, Jack took me back to Dr. Isale, and even though Jack was paying a lot more out in psychiatric fees than he was making, he told the doctor, he said, just get her well. Don't draw it out. I'm going to find some way to pay you. Just get her well. Don't make it, uh, don't make it be a long, drawn-out affair. So Dr. Isale sat Jack down. I was thankful that we had a psychiatrist who was at least honest. And he told Jack, he said, I can't promise you that. He said, I can't even promise you that she'll ever be well. 
He said, you can expect her to be on some kind of antidepressant for the rest of her life. Well, Jack was floored. You can imagine what that did to him. And uh, so he told him, he said, you're a psychiatrist. Why can't you do something? And Dr. Zell made a statement that's very significant. He said, there's not a psychiatrist around who can treat the cause. He said, all medical science can do is treat the symptoms. But he said, we can't treat the cause, so we can't promise you anything. Now, I think it's sad that medical science doesn't know anything about spiritual warfare. They just don't know. And so, <clears throat> needless to say, Jack went home that day, and he was as devastated as I was. And I thank God. I was even thanking God back then, not even knowing if God was there. I was still thanking him that he had given me a wonderful husband because I knew most men would have left their wives. Now, I look back, and I realize that he just saw it as his responsibility to take care of me. Now, this went on for about eight years, and there were times that I thought I couldn't take the emotional and the mental torment another minute. I thought, I, I just can't take this. But I wouldn't allow myself to think about suicide because a lot of people go from there to suicide. But I was afraid that I might wake up on the other side and be in that eternal torment forever. So you couldn't have made me uh, think about suicide. But Jack and my family, they didn't know that. So he always wanted someone to be with me. Well, one night I went out to the clothesline, and this was, I didn't know at the time that it was the thing to do. I was miserable in the house, I was miserable outside, and I remember looking up into the heavens, and I did this probably for the first time. I said, Lord, I don't even know if you're there. You may not even be there, but if you are, would you find me and bring me back? And I remember I didn't feel any different. I just knew that I was totally at the end of myself, probably for the very first time. But some way, at that moment, I had completely given up. Because up until then, I was doing everything I could think of to get myself well. I was trying everything that anybody suggested. And I saw no hope now. And nothing I had tried ever, had ever worked. And believe you me, I had tried everything. So I gave up. And that was what God was waiting for. I know now that God was waiting for me to give up and turn it over to him. And when I did, I look back in retrospect, and I see that when he finally, uh, when I finally gave up trying to fix myself and fell into God's arms, he went immediately to work on that request. And uh, he, he had heard me say, Lord, I'm turning myself over to you. Find me and bring me back. Now, I tried everything that I knew to do in the natural, but things in the natural never work when you're working against a demon. But when I gave up all of my natural efforts and when I cried out to God, he went immediately to work. It's amazing to see how fast God will come on the scene if we'll allow him to. The very next week after I had uh, gone out to the clothesline, Jack decided to go to New Orleans to a Pepsi-Cola management seminar. Uh, he and his dad owned the Pepsi-Cola company. And so my mother kept the children so I could go. And they both had felt like maybe a change of scenery would, would help. And um, we went as far as Austin, Texas the first night and stayed with some old friends that lived there. Now, we would see this couple from time to time, but this was the first time that they had ever mentioned the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we stayed up until 2 o'clock in the morning, just like little hungry birds. And we were just picking their brains, asking every question that we could think of. Jack would ask a question, and I'd ask a question. We were so excited. And I kept thinking that night, could this possibly be the answer that I've been looking for? And so the next day, we went as far as Conroe, Texas. Jack had a canning meeting. He was on the board of directors of this canning Conroe. Conroe Canning Company. Well, Jack never left me alone for any period of time, uh, so he dropped me off at my cousin's house, and uh, my cousin had just recently remarried, and I'd never met his wife before. I had been in her house maybe five minutes when she began to tell me the exact same thing that the couple in Austin had told me. She started talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The second time I was hearing that, I'd never heard it before, and now twice within 24 hours from two different sources. So you can imagine how excited I was. So all the way now to New Orleans, um, that's all we could talk about. I mean, Jack was reminding me of things that they said, and I was reminding him. And we got to New Orleans late in the afternoon. We checked into the hotel, and we left to walk to this little restaurant where we had eaten on our honeymoon some 15 years before. And on the way to the restaurant, we ran across a Logos bookstore. 
Now, I had no idea that Logos meant Word of God. But anyway, we got in the bookstore. And uh, uh, for years now, I had not even opened a book because they frightened me so badly. Everything I read, it was like the enemy made it say something to me. And so I no longer read for fun. So this was nothing short of a miracle that when we went into that bookstore, we both started picking out books to buy. And we couldn't wait to get back to our room that night to read. And we read practically all night that first night. Uh, Jack would go to his seminar in the daytime, and I would stay in the room and read. And at first, he was coming up to check on me every few minutes to make sure I was okay. And finally, he realized I was, I was a different person, and so he just uh, uh, was so thankful. So he didn't come up until it was time to take me to lunch. Then we'd read again, some of the times almost all night. Now, the first book that I uh, read and the one that I remember the most was Pat Boone's A New Song. And I remember Jack read Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Now, by Thursday of that week, it finally dawned on me that God had been orchestrating this. I thought, Lord, you're the one that's behind all this. You know, this couldn't have just happened uh, this casually. And I remember sitting back on the edge of the bed, and I glanced at the clock, and then I said, Lord, I don't even know how to ask this, but I want what all these people have that I've been hearing about. And I remember that I just lay back across the bed, and this heavenly prayer tongue just came pouring out. And the next time I looked at the clock, 40 minutes had passed, and I thought it had been maybe two minutes. I was so, uh, I mean, it, it felt like I was flying. Well, I had never experienced that kind of peace in my life. In fact, it had been so long since I had experienced any kind of peace that I thought, Lord, this is so good, I never want it to end. And I remember just lying there begging God, Lord, please don't let it end. Please don't let it end. And I was just begging him. Now, for some reason, I didn't tell Jack about it that night. Uh, I think I was afraid that if I talked about it, I'd lose it. So anyway, we had gone out to eat that night, and I kept getting up in the restaurant and going to the restroom to see if I could still speak in my prayer time. And then I'd go back, to, uh, and, and I think, I don't know that I remember it. I'd go back, and Jack thought, what on earth is wrong with her? I, I said, I don't know. I think I've got a stomachache. <laughs> but I kept thinking, maybe I've forgotten how to do it. And I was just begging God on the inside, don't let me lose it. Well, that night, I was so peaceful that I went to sleep just the minute my head touched the bed. And on the way home the next day, uh, Jack told me what had happened. He had drifted off to sleep while he was reading, and he began to pray in his prayer tongue. And he thought maybe he was dreaming. So to see whether it was a dream or not, he jotted down some of the words in the margin of his book. His book was lying on the uh, end table. And so the next morning when he got up to go to the seminar, I saw him flipping desperately through the pages of his book. And so I asked him, I said, Jack, is something wrong? And he said, oh, no, no, nothing's wrong. But I could see he was really let down about something. Well, later that morning when I picked up my book and, and, and read for a while, I found all of these strange words scribbled in the margin. <laughs> he had picked up my book by mistake, and uh, he had written the words on the, in my book. So it wasn't really until we started home that we started sharing with each other everything that God had done. And we literally thought we were the only two people in Brownwood, Texas, who had ever even heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, much less had it. And so I want to tell you some of the interesting things here that God does. When Jack got to that management seminar, he found out that everybody in the class was a CPA except him. And uh, he came back and told me, he said, oh, everyone's a CPA. They all he said, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do in this class. Well, the other guys in the class, they were all talking about how hard it was. They'd come back the next morning and they'd say, I studied half the night. This is the hardest course I've ever taken. But Jack was so excited about what God was dealing with him on, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that he would read on his books all night. He never even uh, read on anything uh, uh, for the class. Well, at the end of the week, they gave a very expensive watch. Of course, back then they all wore wristwatches, and the top, the uh, face of his wrist of the wristwatch was a Pepsi crown, and all those guys wanted that. I mean, they were all competing for the watch, and Jack made the top score and won the watch. <laughs> he hadn't even studied. So anyway, we knew uh, God is so amazing.
Well, we came back with the full intention of telling everybody we saw about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We were so excited. Well, I realize now that God knew that I wasn't ready for that kind of a confrontation. You know, in a church that didn't teach that, I mean, that would not have gone over well. And um, those negative words would probably have washed me away because everything was so new and I wasn't grounded in my newfound truth, even though I was happier than I could ever remember being. So God literally protected me by telling us not to share it with anyone. And uh, uh, so Jack and I, at first, we said, we really feel like God's telling us not to share it, but we're so excited we want to, but we didn't. And we went a little over a year. We didn't tell anyone. Jack and I would, at night, we would get together and we'd pray in our prayer tongue together and we would study everything we could find in the Word. And during that year, what it did, it drew Jack and me really close together. And it was like a healing came into our marriage. And I just thought, oh, God, you're so good. And uh, it, it was like uh, that year where I was so far away from God and couldn't even know whether he was there or not. It's like God just washed that away. Well, the next two years... Uh, it's like I was in a bubble of peace. I don't ever remember being that happy, that peaceful. I, I can't even remember even having one day when I wasn't just on top of the world. And so it was wonderful. But after the two years was up, I realized that some of those old fears were beginning to creep up. And I'd push, push them down, and I would really start getting myself real busy doing something because I could sense that old panic was coming and I couldn't understand. I mean, it was just, I just kept telling the Lord, Lord, what is going on? And I cried out to him and I said, Lord, I know you're real. There's no doubts in my mind now about your being real. But these old panic feelings, they're beginning to torment me constantly and I need help. I, I don't know what to do, Lord. You're going to have to help me. You're going to have to do something. Well, the next thing I'm going to say is so important. There is a point this is the point where so many people lose the battle. When they start doing just a little bit better after deliverance and start making a little progress, uh, then there's times that Satan sees to it that the bottom falls out. The enemy's behind that. And many times that's when the person will throw up their hand and, and, and give up thinking that it didn't work. So this is really important. The devil is not going to give up until he absolutely knows that he's never going to win. He's just, he doesn't give up. And that's why we have to know that's his plan. Well, I had uh, tasted victory, and I was determined I was going to hang on. I said, God, I've seen it the other way. I've seen it two years of wonderful. And so in my desperation, I just kept searching the Bible, and I ran across a scripture. And even though I didn't understand it, I somehow knew this was another step in the answer. And God had shown me Joel 2.32. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. I had no idea what deliverance meant. That was just, that was a word that meant nothing to me. But I knew inside of myself that that's what I needed. So I just began to say, Lord, I call on you for deliverance. Lord, I call on you for deliverance. Lord, you said whoever calls on the name of the Lord, uh, calls on the name for deliverance will get their deliverance. And so I'm, I'm calling, I'm calling on you. And I did that over and over and over. Well, finally, one Sunday morning, I was in my bedroom dressing for church. And I was alone, and I had a vision. Of course, I didn't know it was a vision at the time. But I was aware that I was sitting in my bedroom. I didn't go into any kind of a trance, but it was like I could see myself out in front of me. And I was sitting in a chair, and there was a man dressed in white who told me to open my mouth. And when I opened my mouth, I saw a black tooth. And he, then he said, this is what we're going to do. And suddenly, my body in the vision became transparent, and the black roots from that tooth went all down my arms, down my legs, down the trunk of my body. And then the man in white, he pulled that black tooth out with all of those roots, and it left holes. I could see holes throughout my entire body. And then the man says, now, this is what we're going to do. And he began packing those holes with something. And it took a good while as he packed the hose down through my arms, down through my legs. And, and I remember thinking, wow, this is taking a long time. Well, finally, when he finished, he told me to open my mouth. And where that black tooth had been, it was now a totally healed area. Well, you cannot imagine how excited I was. I thought that vision meant that it was over, you know. And I thought the deliverance had taken place while I watched the vision. 
Well, I wish it had been that simple, but I was so excited and I could hardly wait to tell Jack about it. But the next morning, I don't remember now what happened, but something happened and spiritually the bottom fell out. And instantly I was as bad as I'd ever been. And I can remember going to the medicine cabinet and pulling out all the old bottles of medicine, trying to see if I could find some of those old antidepressant pills. I hadn't had one for over two years. And by the way, he had told me to come off the pills gradually. When I got well, I opened the commode and dumped the pills, <laughs> came off of it instantly, which was fine. Uh, it didn't give me any problems. I'm, I'm not suggesting that to anybody else, but I didn't have any problems. But now I'm desperate again. And I was panicked. And all I could think about is that I had to figure out what to do to keep myself from going back into that pit out of which I had come. I forgot the vision. I forgot everything. I just, I was just crying. I, 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 God, I've got to have help. Do something. Now, I didn't realize during this time that Jack was getting as frightened as I was because he had been through it with me. And our prayer partners, by this time, we had another couple that would come and pray with us. And in fact, we had led them in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, these prayer partners, they were also looking for help. Now, I didn't realize that God was orchestrating all of this to find me and bring me back just like I had asked him to do at the clothesline. It just took more than what I was realizing it was going to take. Well, they found a pastor in our town who knew about deliverance. Now, I'd been saying, Lord, I'm crying out to you for deliverance, but I didn't even know what it was. Well, our prayer partners went to Jack, and they said, we think Peggy Joyce has a demon. And Jack said, a demon? <laughs> You know, and so they gave uh, him some tapes to listen to. Well, I found out later that he threw the tapes down and he said, I am not going to be a demon chaser. And he left the, the room. Well, uh, I continually got worse. And finally, he came back and he told him, he said, I'll try anything. I'll try anything. So they introduced us to this pastor and he told us that he wanted us to pray and fast for three days and three nights. Well, we had never fasted a meal. And we didn't know whether we could fast a meal, much less three days and three nights of meals. But I remember that neither one of us ever got hungry. And I can't truthfully say that I had any faith to believe this was going to work, but I didn't have any other choice. And so I was just saying, God, I hope this is you. And, but I was numb. I literally, I remember thinking, I'm numb. I can't feel anything. I can't think anything. I tried every other avenue and... Uh, so we met on the evening of the third day, and the pastor and his wife and this other couple friend and Jack and me. Now, the pastor instructed me to just relax and focus my thoughts on the Lord and let God do all the work. Well, I'd never read a book on, uh, on, on this. I'd never heard a tape on deliverance. You know, uh, I'd never even heard a testimony on deliverance. So I certainly didn't have any preconceived ideas. Well, they began to command a spirit of fear to come out in Jesus' name. And I remember I had my hands up, and as they commanded spirits, I could feel my hands began to go numb. They began to, you know, felt like pins were sticking in them, and they tingled. And I didn't make the connection, and then suddenly my feet and my legs began to go to sleep. And uh, I'm going to describe my experience because some people fear deliverance, but even though my deliverance was probably one of the most dramatic ones I'd ever seen. It was a wonderful experience. There was nothing, anything frightening or anything about it. And pretty soon, I felt like these pins were sticking me all over my body. It moved up my legs, moved up my arms, and I couldn't concentrate on what they were saying for trying to figure out what on earth is going wrong with my body, not making any connection with what they were doing. And I was just getting ready to tell them what was going on when all of a sudden I passed out. And uh, now every salvation experience is different, just like every deliverance is different. So this one's kind of unusual. Uh, <clears throat> but most of them are probably not as dramatic as mine was. And I'm not a dramatic person. Uh, so it was kind of a surprise to me that it happened this way. But anyway, I passed out. And they said I began to scream so loudly that they were afraid the neighbors would come or call the police. And so they went tearing through the house, pulling the windows down and uh, closing the drapes. They even tore my drapes trying to make them close, you know, instead of using the drawstrings. Well, when I came to, they said I'd been out for about 20 minutes. Well, my body was paralyzed. I was lying on the floor. My legs had pulled up against my chest right against my chest, and my arms, uh, it pulled up against my body, and my 
face was numb. My lips had drawn up in a little round circle like I was whistling. And I was just a little ball there on the floor. Maybe not a little ball, big ball there on the floor. But I remember thinking, I can't move any part of my body, but I have no fear. And that's what was just puzzling me. How can I be in this position and have no fear? And uh, I, I, I looked over, I glanced over at Jack, and uh, I remember that he was white as a sheet <laughs> looking at me because he didn't know what was going on. And uh, he said that he was thinking, oh, Lord, please don't let my mother-in-law come. What, what will my mother-in-law say if she sees her daughter in this position? And then he said, finally, it dawned on him, if prayer put her in this position, then prayer can bring her out of it. So he said he got a little bit of a piece. Well, I was looking up at the ceiling, and I had a very vivid mind picture at this time. I could see I was in what I thought was the throne room with Jesus, and I was asking, and I was saying, Lord, why don't you do something? And the Lord said something very significant that I've never forgotten. He said, I've already done it all on Calvary. And I remember when he said that peace just flooded over me. Well, they kept casting out spirits for two hours or more, and it was under so much anointing that... Uh, I thought they're casting things out that they couldn't possibly have known in the natural. And so that let me know this has to be supernatural. Well, the more that deliverance came, uh, the more of the paralysis began to, to, to leave. And I started being able to get some feeling. But all through this, it was absolute peace. Well, that night after we went to bed, Jack and I talked for hours and we said the most phenomenal thing in the world has happened and we can't share it with a person because nobody in the world would believe it. We honestly, had, we didn't know anything like this had ever existed in the entire world. I mean, it's like we were just in shock. Well, the next day I felt light and numb, but I felt so peaceful. That's what was so beautiful to me that all through this, God kept giving me so much peace. But about noon, I started having some of those old thoughts and those old fears again. And I remember, how can this happen with everything I've been through with, with God? But there was a difference now. It was like then I knew it before the, the fears were so inside of me that I felt engulfed in fears and uh, doubt and all that. But this time, you could feel it was on the outside. And uh, it, it was like... I felt peace on the inside, but I felt those things coming at me from the outside. Well, of course, I understand that now. The, the enemy had been cast out, but he was still trying. Now, the reason I, I want you to see the progression, the steps that I went through to get victory, is because some people, in fact, a lot of people I know, after we've seen them go through deliverance, they give up. When, when this starts happening. And they always think, well, I thought I had the victory, but I didn't, and they just give up and walk away. And it was confusing because I thought, you know, I know what happened to me last night was real. I know that deliverance was real. But why didn't it take care of all this? That was confusing to me. Well, the Lord brought back to my remembrance the part of the vision of the period of packing that had taken so long. And he showed me that the packing was as important a part of the deliverance as the pulling of the tooth. Now, it hadn't taken very long to pull the tooth. You know, in other words, it doesn't take long to cast out a spirit. That represented the pulling of the tooth. But it took a good while to do the packing. And the packing was having to renew my mind, renew my thinking that had been so wrong all those years. And um, taking that fear out, replacing it with the word, and that took a long time. I literally spent the next three or four months, maybe even a little longer, sitting in a chair with my Bible and my notebook. And the Lord would take me through the word of God and he would show me spiritual warfare like I'd never seen it before. I'd never seen that in the Bible before. It's like when I read it, I would just read right over the top. But this time, God was letting me see exactly what had happened. Now, one of the first things that he spoke to me is that, he, that I had to make the word my final authority. That God spoke to me several times during this period of time, but it was just a phrase. You know, it wasn't, wasn't long. But he said, you have to make the word your final authority in everything. And I realized that all those little tidbits that he would speak to me ever so often were so important. And I remember that it, that seemed impossible. I thought, I don't know how I can make the word my final authority. If I'm going to live in this world, it's not going to match with the word. So how can I live in this world and make the word my final authority? And um, 
So it was during this period of time that I, when I was saying, God, I want to do what you're telling me to do. I don't know how to do it. That someone asked me to go with them to a little church called Bethel Temple. They said, we have a prophet coming tonight. Well, I'd never heard of a modern day prophet. And so I didn't know what to expect. But one of the reasons that I went was mainly out of curiosity. But the church was full. I mean, it was running over. And I found a place to sit in the middle of the back row. So I, I wanted to be in a very inconspicuous spot, you know. But after the message, during the ministry time, this prophet pointed to me and said, I've got a word for you. Come up. And I'd never heard of a prophecy before. I'd, I'd never heard of a, a, a modern-day prophet, you know. I didn't know we had prophets in, the, in uh, this day and time. Now, remember, the whole prophecy, I, I remember one portion, and I'll never forget it. The Lord began to say through that prophet, God wants you to make up your mind that you're going to choose to believe his word. And then he said it again. God wants you to make up your mind that you're going to choose to believe his word. Well, I, I was hearing it kind of shaking my head, you know. But all of a sudden, he said it again, and he said it again, and he said it again. And I'm not exaggerating. And um, I was embarrassed. I thought, what are all these people thinking? I mean, I can remember that I could feel my face turning red, you know. And I thought, he's not going to stop. He's just going to keep saying that. And so finally, I thought, I better stop and hear what he's saying, <laughs> you know. Make up your mind that you're going to choose to believe my word. And suddenly I realized that he was telling me how to do that. Uh, he was telling me, it's just a choice. You, you can either believe the world or you can believe my word. And it's a choice. Make up your mind that you're going to choose to believe my word instead of the world, what the world is saying. And I heard that. So that night I remember saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to make your word my final authority. Don't know how it's going to work. Don't know how I'm going to be able to do that at living in this world, but I choose to do that. Well, after I passed that first hurdle, <clears throat> the word began to really come alive. And God began to show me the schemes of the enemy over my life. And as he was showing me how the enemy had had one scheme after another, he said, I'm going to give you an exchange system. And uh, boy, that, that little phrase just stood out. And I thought, okay, Lord, I, I want to know what the exchange system is. And as simple as that little exchange system is, it's the way in which we win over the enemy every single time, no matter what the battle is. Now, I'm going to give you this exchange system in a nutshell because it works. Every thought we have will have been influenced by God and his word, or it will have been influenced by Satan and the world. It's going to come from one of two places. And God told me that I had to take every thought that didn't line up with the word of God I had to take every thought that stole my peace and stole my joy, and I was to exchange that thought for a thought from God's Word. And I knew it was going to take time. Uh, and, but God said, whatever the thought is, immediately, did it come from the world? Did it come from me? And then he said, look in your Word until you find a promise, and you're going to have to believe my Word. Well, about that time, God gave me Hebrews 5.14. By practice, you train our senses to discern between good and evil. And so the Lord showed me it's going to take practice. But by practice, you're going to have to train yourself that you're going to discern, is this coming from me or is this coming from the Word? And it took a long time. I'm not going to say it was easy, but the Lord impressed me that it didn't matter what thought it was that came. It could be a thought of sickness or death, or it could be a thought of jealousy or fear or despair or insecurity, a thought of divorce or lust or whatever, whatever the thought. I had to take whatever that negative thought was and exchange it for an opposite thought or an opposite promise out of God's word. And then I, and the Lord said it was important to say it out loud and say it out loud until I made the exchange. And so that's exactly what 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 is meaning when it says that we're to take every thought captive and pull it down, pull it down out of our mind by saying what God's word says. So I thought, you know, Lord, everything you're telling me to do, it's backed up in the word of God. Now, it took a lot of time. It wasn't easy at first because I realized that about 99% of my thoughts were influenced by fears or doubts or insecurity. And so I was 
not, I wasn't necessarily a negative person, but I had formed habits of thinking on things that didn't line up with the Word of God. It had become a habit. And I had to exchange every wrong thought, every fearful thought, with a promise out of God's Word. And the Lord began to show me that to walk in the Spirit, I couldn't go by sight, couldn't go by circumstances. I had to go by faith in whatever it was that God said, regardless of the circumstances. And I remember thinking, that could be pretty impossible. <laughs> you know, it just sounded pretty impossible. And, but the Lord didn't give up. He said, you're going to have to go by faith in whatever it is I say. And then he gave me 2 Corinthians 4.18. He said, the things you see are temporal. But he said, the things that are not seen are eternal. And so he was showing me that, that anything I could see, it, it was temporal. It was subject to change. But the things that were not seen, the things of God, those were the things that were eternal. That's what I had to choose. And so the Lord also began showing me that these demonic spirits, they weren't indwelling my spirit man. I was a Christian. My spirit man was indwelt by the uh, Spirit of God. But all of these spirits of fear and doubt and panic and all these things uh, that had tormented me so long, they were coming in my soulish realm, in my mind, in my will, in my emotions. And that was the part of me that had to be renewed after my deliverance. That's where the repacking was. That's why he said that it was going to take a long time because I had to repack, take out those old and, and put in the new. So in Matthew 12, 28, he showed me if I cast out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God can come upon you. And I can remember when God spoke that to me. I didn't know my Bible very well. So he would speak scriptures to me and, and I'd find them. And it, it, it was really exciting and um, so when he spoke this, I started saying, Lord, what is the kingdom of God? You know, is it heaven? Is it when we go to heaven? And then he showed me there in Romans 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It was supposed to start now. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. It's when we're in his righteousness, when we're receiving his peace, and we're receiving his joy in the Holy Spirit. So no wonder I could never have peace and joy in the Holy Spirit because my mind and my emotions were so filled and cluttered with harassing spirits that there wasn't any room for peace. You know, uh, there were those periods of time when I had supernatural peace, but God wanted me to have it all the time. And so he was showing me there wasn't any room for joy. There wasn't any room for righteous thoughts when my mind was cluttered with doubts and fears. So God showed me that those demon spirits were very subtly putting thoughts in a person's mind, and they either put the thoughts in a person's mind directly or they put them in directly. And, uh, for example, he said uh, when a person thinks, I'm having a heart attack or I don't think I love my mate anymore, that's when he's sending those thoughts to us in first person. But the enemy also gives us thoughts through circumstances, you know, through maybe something we see or hear, and it'll trigger a thought. And then he immediately always accompanies that thought with an emotion. He doesn't just put a thought in their mind. When you get that thought, you're going to have a, an emotion of fear or despair or jealousy. There's going to be a, an emotion that goes with it. And he says it's a process to break the, break the habit as he's cleaning us up, as he's perfecting us. Now, the more we cleaned up, the more of the righteousness, peace, and joy starts coming on us. And he said, that's when you know you're getting well. It's when you start walking in, in his righteousness, you believe his word, you start walking in his joy, and you start walking in his peace. Now, I began to experience a love walk, and that was, I think, the most fun of the entire thing that I went through. I started experiencing a love walk that I didn't even know existed. When I saw the kind of love that would keep loving me even after I turned my back on him, time after time after time, and yet he never left me, uh, he never forsook me, that he just kept drawing me by his spirit through all those progressive steps until he could finally heal and deliver me and return the years that the canker worm had eaten. I realized how much he loved me and how could I not love and serve a God who loved me that completely. And that's when the love walk just started coming alive. And um, uh, back then he started giving me songs. I if you can believe it, I can't do any of the music now, but he's given me songs, and I would sing those songs. And um, some of them were pretty good. 
Uh, but I'd have to have somebody else sing them to you. <laughs> but when I think of a God who loves us so completely, I would never want to hurt him by, by mixing kingdoms. You know, some people, they'll mess around with, their, their say that they're saved, but they'll mess around with new age mess. And I thought when we really know how much God loves us, we wouldn't mix the, uh, what God's given us with something else for anything in the world. Uh, we wouldn't ever play around with something outside of his word or violate his word any more than we would want to violate our marriage, you know. So sometimes it's hard to believe that I'm the person back there that went through all that and, and what he's done. Sometimes I just think, God, I, I must not be the same person. I can't believe what you brought me through. And it's almost as though I'm, when I give my testimony, it's almost like I'm talking about somebody else. Uh, but God will bring us step by step. Uh, but it's his power that does it. But he'll bring us step by step every step of the way. And, and it's like we stand back and we think, God, <laughs> I'm not doing this. You're doing this. But I had a part to play. I could have stopped anywhere along the way. And as we've taken people through deliverance, we've seen people who have stopped along the way. And it was just, it was more than what they wanted, and they walked away. And I thought, oh, I can't even begin to tell them what they've missed out on. But he showed me that the determining factor in, in, in anyone's getting well is their choice not to give up on God anywhere along the way. That's the determining factor. Because so many people, they get tired or whatever happens, and, and they finally give up. And Satan is always going to tempt us, tempt us to run from God in fear and in disappointment. He always puts that in front of people. But the answer is that we have to run to God and not from him. And I realized when this all started happening way back in the beginning, every time those fears would come, I was running from God. I was running to the encyclopedia or running someplace else. But God says, don't ever run from me, run to me. Now, I had made a decision that I was in it for the long haul. And I had already decided, Lord, if I never see this work, if I never see it work, you know, uh, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And I'm going to go home <laughs> just not seeing it work because I, I'm going to believe it from now on. But praise God, it did work. And praise God, uh, I found out that there is no demonic stronghold that can't be broken. It doesn't matter how big it is. We've taken people through deliverance, and they said, I've done some things that are so bad God can't help me. Listen, there is nothing that God can't forgive and completely wash away if a person will, will believe him. Whatever it takes to be obedient is not worthy to be compared to the victory that's in us, uh, in, uh, that's there for us if we'll just take it. So, Father, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for my deliverance. I thank you, Lord. There was a time that I didn't see how I could ever get well, and Lord, you did it step by step. But Father, <clears throat> I realize I made it last a long time because I ran from you instead of to you. And the moment that I ran to you, the moment I started saying, Father, uh, find me and bring me back to you. I've done everything I know to do, and I can't get back there. But Lord, find me and bring me back. The moment I came to that, it didn't take long. And you did find me, and you did bring me back. And then you showed me how to keep the deliverance. Father, it's not just a matter of getting the deliverance. It's a matter of knowing the steps to keep it. And Father, I cannot thank you enough. And I'm asking, Father, that this testimony will help other people to, to know the steps to take to be able to come get set free. Lord, we just love you and praise you. I thank you for this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.